This week I've been caused to think about um, Jesus being introduced to the world as the Lamb of God. And to us it could seem strange to introduce somebody as a lamb. Uh, And yet for the Jews, the lamb had great significance. Not only was the lamb a sacrificial animal, but the lamb featured in one of their most prominent annual feasts, the Passover. This was a feast that was held in remembrance of a day many years ago when after 400 years of cruel bondage and captivity to the Egyptians, God made a way for his people to escape. God said that on a certain night he would pass over Egypt and the firstborn of The firstborn male of both man and animal would perish in every household. And God made a way in which the children of Israel could be spared. And that way of salvation was through the Lamb. It was on the night of the Passover in Jerusalem before Jesus was to die, the day before he was to die, when Jesus instituted what today we know as communion. And essentially, Jesus was explaining to his disciples that this Passover is fulfilled in me. Going forward, I will be your Passover lamb. Going forward from my death, you will have um, the opportunity to be set free from the bondage of sin and death. And you will be able to walk in a new covenant with your God. And so I've been looking at the Passover and there's three ordinances in the Passover. And there's a, a spiritual parallel for us today. So the first ordinance was the shedding of blood and it wasn't enough for the blood of the lamb to be shed but the blood had to be applied to the doorposts of the home and this wasn't just a sign to the destroying angel that would pass over that this household was protected from the wrath of God but this was an outward declaration to anyone that passed by that this household believes what God has said. This household has accepted God's way of salvation and this household is sheltering under the blood of the lamb. And today for us as Christians, it's not enough that the, la- that the blood of the lamb has been shed, but we need to apply it to our own hearts and to our own lives. And there needs to be an outward declaration that we believe God, that we've accepted his way of salvation and that we're sheltering under the blood of the lamb. The second ordinance was partaking in the lamb. It wasn't enough that the lamb was slain, but the children of Israel, everyone in every household, had to eat the lamb. There had to be a feeding on the lamb, a consuming and an internalizing of the lamb, and they couldn't pick and choose what parts they ate. Every part had to be eaten, even the inward parts. And Jesus said in John chapter 6, He said, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And of course, this was metaphorical language, but what Jesus was saying is, it's not enough that I've died, but you need to feed on me. You need to take me into your own heart and into your own life, internalize me. the Lamb of God, get your sustenance and your nourishment from me. Dwell in me and I will dwell in you. The third ordinance was the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And this was really for subsequent Passovers. But um, God said that from the day the Lamb was slain, the 14th day through the 21st day, there wasn't to be any leaven, this like yeast, found in, in any house of the Israelites. And he said that if any Israelite ate leavened bread, um, which would be most of the bread that we know today, he said they are to be cut off from Israel. Like, this was serious. And so you can imagine that leading up to the Passover, there would be a great searching of the house and a removing of any old leaven, casting it out. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul addressed the continual and willful sin that was among some still in the church. And he addressed the the tolerance that had come towards that sin among the church. And he said there, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And in chapter 11, he addressed the divisions that were among the church and the wrong attitudes that were in their hearts as they came together to partake of communion. 
he had to explain to them again the very essence of communion. And he said, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the blood, body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let there be a searching of your hearts. Let there be a repenting from any sin that could be there, any willful sin, a casting out so that you can partake worthily. You can't be still living under the old covenant with sin and claiming and professing to be partaking of the new covenant with Christ. I love to think of that morning in in Egypt when the Egyptians awoke to find all of their firstborn slain. And yet in the house of the Israelites, they'd realize our sons have been spared. Wouldn't they feel it was worth it? It was worth sacrificing the lamb. It was worth putting the blood on the doorpost. It was worth partaking of the lamb it was worth believing and obeying God and imagine if you were the firstborn son you'd wake and you'd realize well that lamb he died for me and he took my place may we consider these things this morning as we prepare our hearts to partake of communion so I want to follow on from one thing that Monique said and that how would you have felt if you were the oldest son in each family? Would you be worrying through the night or would you be able to rest in peace knowing, well, God said this, so I'm going to believe it? But then what about the next year, the next time that you went through the Passover feast again? You would remember what it was like that you were the oldest son that could have very well been killed that night if it wasn't for you and your family's faithfulness to God. Yesterday, we were able to celebrate our first anniversary. An anniversary is always something to go back to and remember, what was the original commitment that I made? What did that mean? And each Passover would have been just like that, especially for the ones who were there on that first night. But then at the Last Supper, what Jesus did is he instituted what we call communion. As a renewal and a reminder of the new covenant and the grace that we are now living under. So when we do this, we are able to eat the bread, we are able to drink the juice or the wine or whatever we use when we do it. And remember our commitment that we made to Christ. Remember the fact that he saved us and is still making us more like him each day. So let's take and eat the bread and remember that it was Jesus' body who was broken for us so that ours didn't have to be. Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant. There is no more need to kill a lamb for each and every family every year. I have died once for all, so you don't need to. So let's drink this together and be reminded of what we are saved by. Lord, we are so grateful that we do not have to live separated from you. But we are reminded every time we do this, it is not our doing, it is not by our power. It is by yours alone. And this is what we all have in common. We are united in the fact that we are all saved by you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. As we collect the cups, we're going to sing through verse 1 and verse 4 of that song again. 
and remember that Jesus was the lamb that was shed for us. And it is only by following him, by taking him into our hearts and being obedient and faithful that we are saved. Lord, it is good to remember together that we are saved by faith in you alone. We seek to become more like you. We seek to be saved by you in every moment of every day. Lord, I lift up Brendan to you now and the message that you have given him. May we be receptive to what you are wanting to say to us. May we be honest with ourselves and open to you, willing to be vulnerable, not with hardened hearts, but obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Today's reading is Genesis chapter 9, following on from last week's chapter 8. Um, first, the first 17 verses. Thank you. Good morning. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all of these beasts on the earth and on all of the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every, every animal and from each human being too. And I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For the in the image of God, as God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and, so, and to his sons with him, I, know, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and, will, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, and all those that came out of the ark with you, and every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all the life on the earth. Thank you.
Well, what a great day to be here. Church is full again. I don't know what we're going to do about you all because you're starting to not fit. So there's, a, there's always a front row. Just got to add another one to the back and or this one here. Yeah, put that one at the back, then that's the front. No, it doesn't work, does it? I don't know what's going on there, but no one likes to be spat on by the pastor. That's what it is. Who was here last week? So put it down. Who wasn't here last week? That might be easier. It's a few. Okay. Um, not too many, though. So last week we kicked off with Chapter 8 called New Beginnings. So the new year, and we, um, I start the Bible in a year, reading every January, and then by February I've messed up the whole process and got slack or whatever, but not this year. Uh, but we revisit Noah's story, and it's not just a Sunday school lesson, is it? It was a horrendous thing in the history of the earth, and certainly for mankind. And as we just read, all life was destroyed. It's not just this little cartoon thing of a boat floating around that we used to have one in the bath and the animals sat in the top and you'd try and make waves to make them fall out whatever it would have been a scary time for Noah and we looked at that if you missed last week's we unpacked what would it have been like about 10 months in this thing before the the raven was let out and uh, I asked people what did you get out of that message and they're like oh we like the crow joke I'm like oh, okay those of you who missed that, it was there's scientific evidence that the raven is still looking for the ark. Ark! Ark! Anyway, not as funny second time around, but the same people still laugh, though, so I heard that. It's good. So we move on to chapter 9, and um, we, we ch- touched on some of these things, particularly with the rainbow last week, so we may not go right to the end, but there's some key things that I've been looking at this week if we can have that on the screen again verse one so this they've just pulled up on the mountain with the ark and even that we discussed last week was a miracle that it didn't go and then as the waters receded it would have should have went and then they still had to live two more months on the thing so God had his hand on this the whole time for it to be sitting in a way that they could still be in there while the waters went down and and what did it look like the utter devastation, everything covered in mud. And, and we can see in places like the Grand Canyon, it, it does my head in when these geologists, clearly I know more than they do, because I've studied this. When they're saying, look at the millions of years of erosion that's formed this thing. And I'm like, that actually doesn't make sense, because a long, slow erosion is, makes everything flat. This was a heck of a lot of water real quick rushing down this valley. And then you see the layers and the animals and some of the trees go up through multiple layers. Well, that's a millions of year old tree to do that, isn't it? No, it was buried like that under all these different cataclysmic events. Anyway, what do we know as humans, eh? As Christians, we're called pretty dumb, but it makes sense to me that it was a flood encased the entire earth, and God's telling us how it happened. So God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Now, fruitful doesn't mean grow an orchard, even though that's the first thing he did when he is in the next chapter. But it means have lots of kids. Now, we have different culture today that sort of says, even the Western culture says, oh, just have a couple because there's too many people on the planet already. I'm actually not sure about that. I think the people who push that, that fear about we're overpopulating the earth, and there's a bigger agenda going on there. We touched on that, that last week. Um, the climate change, it's all that kind of stuff. And, and if you're a fisherman, we said this last week too, climate change is a good thing. More water, more seas, more fishing spots, bring it on, whatever. But I believe, and there, are a lot, there is a lot of poverty And there seems to be a lot of food shortages. But when you look at what's creating that, I don't think it's too many people. It's maybe too many people in certain spots. But it's man's corruption and government's greed and the fact that we we don't share the resources we have. Um, And that's what causes these famines. We mismanage the land, which causes, you know, 
d droughts and pestilence and all that kind of stuff as well. That's certainly part of it. But here God gives Adam, uh, Noah, I, was, I mentioned Adam because it's very similar to Adam all over again, right? There's a few more people, there's eight people instead of two. But he says a very similar thing. Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Like what he said to Adam. Go and have lots of kids because we need people again because they're all gone. Verse 2 says, um, the fear and the dread. There's a, we'll come back to the Adam thing because there's a little bit of difference about what was said. But I find this actually quite interesting. Verse 2, the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth. So basically, I'm going to make animals scared of you. So what I'm assuming here, and a lot of commentators assume, is that animals weren't that scared of people before now. Probably because they weren't hunted that readily, because when you look at what God said to Adam, he said, I've given you all the plants and fruit to eat. He never mentioned actually eating meat. So there probably wasn't a whole lot of meat. Um, that's a bit of an assumption, but... I find it interesting that what if animals just weren't scared of people before this time? It seems, actually I believe that because it's, you say I'm giving that fear of, an, of man to animals from now on. Why? Because you're going to eat a lot of them. Now f imagine hunting and, and, and these, whatever you're hunting, the caribou just walks up to your tent and goes, huh? and you're like, Phew. and then its mother comes over and goes, what happened here? There wouldn't be many left real quick, eh? So God's made it a bit more sporting that you got to find them and catch them and they're going to smell you a kilometre away and they're going to be startled like this. And there's, I see all the hunters going, oh, yeah, I love this stuff. But it's hard going, isn't it? And then you've got to cart the thing back. It's never near your car if you're killing something for meat. Three kilometres, you're carrying this thing. and We well, do this every Thursday afternoon. But not really, but... Very interesting. Hey, and it makes sense that animals weren't scared of people because what was Noah's instructions? I'm gonna, he said, I'm going to send animals to you and two by two, they're going to walk up the ramp. You've seen the pictures? They all got in a line and went <laughs> right at the time, next. And he's got his clipboard there going, caribou, wallabies, chihuahua. Oh. Great Danes, let's take that species. We'll come back to the little ones later on. Uh, if they were scared of him, they wouldn't have been anywhere near the place, right? So I just find this really interesting. It, it makes sense. And how did Noah look after these animals if they were freaking out in the corner of the cage every time? So I believe there would be some kind of a miraculous peace, but it still would have been tough on the ark. Very interesting if you go home and think about this stuff. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky. I was going along on my bike yesterday and I thought, I'll go real quiet and these ducks will just watch me go past. No, there were hundreds of them going everywhere, completely freaking out. Birds are scared of us. On every creature that moves along the ground and all the fish in the sea, wouldn't it be cool? When you went snorkeling, they come to look at you. Actually, might be a bit scary, actually. <laughs> Too many. They are given into your hand. So he's now saying this is going to be a food source for you, but you're going to have to work for it too. So the case that humans shouldn't eat meat, I, I don't really go for that. How much red meat, that's arguable, and all the things, benefits to health and all those kind of things. Um, we can talk about that, but I don't think there's a problem. And God said, I've given you uh, this, this for, your, for your food. But I'm grateful that big animals are scared of us too. Uh, like even usually crocodiles. I don't know about crocodiles actually. They'll shoot through off the bank if you go past them, but... If they know you can't see them, they're not scared. They're looking at you like a big steak. So that's different. Um, but imagine if cows, I probably said this last week, I have cows that big and they try and get away from me when I'm trying to spray 
mouthwash on them for flies. I don't know why they don't like it. We sort of keep a safe chemicals and the, the minty freshness. The, the flies don't like it. Makes the meat taste good too. But um, Imagine if they just went, forget you, Jack. Trample me to get to the treats I'm trying to give them. Or a horse. It doesn't make sense that a, a scrawny teenage girl can sit on a horse and lead it where it doesn't want to go. And there's actually, um, I forget the name of the commentator, years ago, decades, a hundred years ago probably, that quoted, made this little poem about it. It makes no sense that a beast with such power, imagine if the horse realised its power and suddenly didn't fear its rider. You ain't going nowhere except off. Um, But there becomes relationships and through with horses that's a little bit different, but... Uh, it does. There's actually a verse, I can't quote it here, but it looks like in the end times, this fear is taken away from them and it creates complete chaos. You're no longer the, the cow or the horse whisperer, it's the yeller and the runawayer, probably. Anyway, he actually gave animals protection by fearing us too. There's another way to look at it, because if, like we talk about with hunting, they need to be able to run or or not just walk up to become our on our dinner plates hunting would be too easy verse three everything that lives and moves about will be food for you now this is interesting because later on with moses he narrowed down some animals that weren't good for us i think there's cultural health reasons um, for some of those as well like no shellfish or anything that eats the guess the garbage off the bottom of the sea and certainly now it's probably even worse with the stuff on the bottom of the sea but interesting even pork was certainly come in then and there's different opinions about that we don't mind our own bacon now we don't believe we have to come under a lot of those specific laws anymore but um, I've given you everything Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So there's a much more freedom here than with Adam as well. But he also, like he said to Adam, I'm giving you all this except... So there's there's an exception here. There's something. I don't want you to eat this. Now, with Adam, it was the tree of the um, knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Don't... Don't eat that. Uh, But now he says, don't, verse 4, you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. Now this is where it gets more interesting, or equally interesting, because the, the language of blood, and I really appreciate what you guys shared this morning around communion, the significance of blood throughout the whole story of the scripture. Um, the word blood is used 424 times in the Bible in 357 b- verses. And uh, so we're going to have a little, probably most of this message will be looking about the significance of the blood. He doesn't just say blood, but he calls it the life blood. And why is that? He goes on in verse 5, And for your life blood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. So what that means is, well, it's explained in the next verse, whoever sheds human blood, so whoever kills a person, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God, God has made mankind. Here, God gives, I guess, the um, the okay for capital punishment. It's called. It's called. If someone murders someone, God's saying the person who murdered that person must have must die. Now, the good thing about this rule, it sounds really harsh, but the good thing it means murders don't happen as much because it's a harsh penalty. And that actually is true in a lot of countries still today where they know that they will be executed if they commit murder. Um, There's a lot less of it. And it's often our Western countries that have uh, watered down these laws 
uh, from certainly from this time. <laughs> and um, there's a consequence to that, I think, as I've been thinking about it this week. It even says, even if an animal kills another person, we still have that with dogs, crazy dogs that may maul a person. They get put down. Um, but God even says here, if any beast, a rogue deer or a bull or a boxing kangaroo or whatever it is, kills a person, that animal must die. And you think, oh, it's a little harsh. The animal was probably just looking after itself or maybe we cornered it. But there's, this, there's something God's explaining here that I really uh, want to have a look at today. God is saying you better respect the principle of life Actually, even in an animal. Have you ever seen those hunting shows where they, or the, the alone, you know, they're these, these nature guys and they're out and they've hunted a squirrel and they're starving. And they're like, oh. They actually say, thank you, little guy, for giving your life. I don't know if he gave it. I think he was running and you whacked him with a shingai, but a shangai or an arrow or something. Um, but there's a respect there, and I always thought, oh, it's a bit of a native Indian thing to do. But I'll read this one and go, you know what? We do actually need to respect that a living creature has lost its life for our sustenance. And God's telling a pic- painting a picture that will eventually lead to the gospel through this kind of stuff. As I said, the word blood is used over 400 times. When blood is poured out, Life is poured out. Anyone here a paramedic or we've got a couple of doctors and a few nurses? Blood's the thing you've got to keep in, right? If you go to an accident and there's carnage everywhere and multiple people hurt, the triage is whoever's bleeding the most is the one we need to get to first because as the blood disappears, the life is disappearing like out of a person. And that's exactly how God explains it. The respect for blood is not based on superstition or mysticism, but blood represents the life of the being, whether it's an animal or a person. Interestingly, in Leviticus chapter 17 and 11, uh, he explains it to Moses quite clearly, and this is how they have to understand it. It says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonements for one's life. So he's saying here that the, the symbol of life is blood. And if there is sin, something has to pay for that sin. And sin is so serious, it actually has to be paid by blood, by life of that creature. Either, and in this, the Old Testament, it was the, the animal had to be killed and blood was shed to pay for your sin, pointing the picture to the ultimate reality of Jesus becoming that lamb. Put so well this morning, as Monique shared, with the whole story of the Passover. We just gloss over it. We don't really even do it as as Christians as much as the Jewish people. But that, their understanding is quite profound of this. <clears throat> over and over again, we see the central place of the blood. It was the sign of mercy, as we've heard this morning, at the first Passover for Israel. And I appreciate that message. The firstborn male, that would have been me. Imagine that, losing me. Can anyone... (laughs) Man, I can't think of how that would be anyway. but, um, But the blood sealed God's covenant with Israel. When you... You see it from every different angle. Blood sanctified the altar where the sacrifice had to happen, made it a special holy place. Blood set aside the priests from others. Uh, Not only in the line of they had to be born with a certain family, but in the sprinkling and the ceremony, they used blood. Blood makes atonement for God's people. That means he'll make God and us at one. Um, fixing the separation that sin causes. Blood does that, brings us together with God. Blood sealed the new covenant in Jesus Christ, of course. So how, as we think of the significance of the life blood, the, the blood is the life of a being, how much more special and how does God see the significance of his one and only son who lived a perfect life? Do you remember in the story of Cain and Abel when Abel... No, Cain killed Abel. 
God said, why is your brother's blood crying out to me from the earth? I think, wow, that's full on. It isn't just, why is he laying dead there? Or what, what's that smell? There's something special about the life that was taken and God takes it seriously. Jesus' blood does these things. It justifies us, takes away our sin, brings redemption, brings us, pays for what's owed, cleanses us from sin, makes us new, allows us to enter God's holy place. Jesus' blood brings us into God's family. We become his children. The power of the blood of Christ enables us to overcome Satan. Isn't that a pretty cool one? When you, when it says we are to pray, plead the blood over ourselves. That's where the power is. It's not because I'm a Christian, I'm a superman and I can withstand the devil. I've got nothing without the blood of Christ and what it's done in all those things that I've just mentioned. But, and, and it's kind of like the kryptonite for Satan. He just can't touch us when we have the blood of Christ over us. There's always been something sacred in God's view about blood. The poured out blood means something special to God, as we just read in Cain and Abel's story. I actually want to mention here, and we've had conversations about this, and I kind of only just thought about this, but as we read through God's understanding of this, The world would say today that you are responsible for your own life, so if you want to end it all you can just take it and end your own life well as I read what God says it's it's like it's actually more special than that you were made in my image if I choose for you to have your last breath that's my choice you are my creation so this euthanasia or suicide is a, a horrible thing and I I don't know we think about God's perspective on it near enough because it's a, a really serious matter for God. Now I know there's, there may be people, there's probably everyone's touched at some point in their lives unfortunately with suicide and I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that that person's damned to hell but I don't know and I don't think it's worth the risk and there's far more available to us to get people through some horrible situations where they get to think that's the only option they have left we also know God is fair and I've heard stories of people that just suffered so much and I I see why it happened that they end up they couldn't take it any longer and God saw all that and he's a fair judge so um we do pray that we see those who had a really hard time on earth with the Lord Jesus through his grace that was not so evident in their life, but somehow uh, they came to know him. There's always been something sacred in God's view about blood. How much more precious the blood of Jesus, his only son. I've underlined this and put it in bold. His blood is the only thing that will reconcile you to God. The blood of Jesus should be one of the most sacred and important things to a believer. And it's no surprise that our culture and the world uses bad language even about this. How many times, like, bloody this and blood, oh, and the name of Christ... Some would even put the two together and it should make us cringe that people are blaspheming the blood of Christ. It's an, it shouldn't be easy as we shouldn't get for us to get used to. As for you, verse 7, be fruitful, increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then we talk about the rainbow for the next few verses. I think we touched on that a fair bit last week, um, how that the rainbow God made has seven colours, the rainbow of the pride symbol for all that um, trans and, or gay movement or whatever it's called, only has six, which is significant, six colours. Six is the number for man. 
and sin and falling short of God and seven is the the fulfilled number uh, a God's number I guess so I guess as we go from there um, we could keep reading for all the the different verses about the the um, rainbow but I don't think we'll do that except that to say that he he doesn't want to, us to live in fear. And the rainbow is uh, a promise. And God cannot go back on a promise. So we, first thing is we don't have to fear that we're all going to drown from a flood. It could be something else. He didn't give us multiple promises about other things. And in fact, Revelation said there's a big chunk of people die in the end for all different disasters. But when we have faith in God and we look at his word, and then remember the last verse of the last chapter says there will always be summer, winter, harvest, time for sowing, because that's how God's ordained it. So when we hear in the world that we're all going to die, we're all going to burn, every, this place is getting too cold, this place is too hot, it's all in God's hand. I don't, I don't think that fear is warranted because the one saying it also say they have the cure and it involves giving them all money, power and control. So I think we're aware of that here. Um, but we're going to finish with a, a prayer, I guess, um, that something about today's message would help us not only appreciate the blood and the blood of Christ and the story that's been laid out for us that we need a saviour and there's only one way to be saved and that's through Jesus but it's also and I've had experience this week I won't go into details because it affects people in this room but when you say Lord use me this afternoon in fact my plan was to go to my caravan which is at mum and dad's place and they're away so I often bludge at their place and they don't even know unless they watch this video um, I want to I just want to hear from you God I don't feel close to you. I feel like I'm doing churchy things. But I want to sit and, and maybe it's through worship or through reading your word. I want to spend time with you. And what happened was I ended up speaking to a person for three and a half hours um, in a completely random encounter and I had nowhere else to be. And it was the highlight of my week too, that God saw both of us. And because I was in a position where I'm willing to be available and someone else needed to know that God was watching, we met. And I wonder how many opportunities we miss because we just do our thing and flick on Netflix or YouTube every evening as we get home. And when you say, God, if there's anybody, if there's anything I need to be doing to hear from you and be used by you, that's why I'm here. And Noah was a special example of hearing from God, the relationship he had with God all through that time and forever after, for years, hundreds of years after. Um, there's something we learn from that. As the band comes up, let me pray and um, we'll finish up. Lord God, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic when we talk about blood and the world goes, oh, that's a weird thing to say that we have to, even the people that heard Jesus say it were a bit freaked out by it. But for us as believers, we want the blood of Jesus Christ to be something so special to us that it does its work in us that it was intended to do. Thank you that it pays for our sin that we may be with you. For any person here who hasn't made that step to trust in the gift of the cross of the Lord Jesus, who gave his life for us, but then took it up again and rose again, he paid for our sin that we may live everlastingly through faith in him. If anyone's here is yet to make that step, or they're realizing that they've taken it for granted, and you're calling them to a deeper relationship with you, I pray that this morning that they do business with you or they meet with you or ask someone to pray with them. That, thank you that today's a new day. Tomorrow is the beginning of a new week. Many go back to work and school goes 
people go back to school, many kids this week as well. We want to live our lives for you and start afresh and have your Holy Spirit with us, whatever we do. So we thank you for this time. We pray as we sing this last song that uh, it'll be pleasing to you and the words within this old hymn will also speak to our hearts. May you help us connect with each other, love each other, those that are are needing a a special touch from um, a friend or to share their story or they've been lonely or they're unwell, there's people sick. Use your church, Lord, in ways that you know we need to be active. In Jesus' name, amen.